Hello and welcome everyone to the Wall Street Blockchain Alliance's Crypto Roundup for Friday, September 13th, 2024. Ron Quaranta here with my amazing and genius co-hosts, Joshua Ashley Clayman and David Brill. Uh, again, my friends, we've had to blow up the agenda because there's so much new news, economic data, regulatory updates. Before we begin, for everyone in the audience, thank you all for joining us. Our usual disclaimer is obviously nothing we're discussing should be considered any type of advice. And our opinions are our own. They don't necessarily represent our respective firms. With that, Josh, David, let us kick off. It's been a busy week. Summer is over. Um, for everyone who's watching LinkedIn Live or Twitter or YouTube, if you've got questions for Josh or David or I, please put them in the chat. We'll address them as soon as we can. Uh, David, how are you, brother? I'm great. How are you, Ron? I'm enjoying some warm weather here in South Florida and... Uh... You know, the Bitcoin markets decided to go up uh, today for us. Uh, yeah, yeah. We're almost near 60K, so uh, good way to start off the weekend. David, we've got some economic data to cover, but Josh, if, if uh, and I know we didn't do much prep because the three of us have been running around quite a bit. I wanted to kick off with a little bit of the stuff that's going on from a regulatory perspective and a legislative perspective. The Coinbase case keeps moving forward. I wanted to raise... Some of what you're seeing from a regulatory perspective, and I think the, the other thing that three of us need, really need to talk about is uh, not too political, but the presidential debate was mm -hmm. this week. Uh, and I think the three of us wagered that there would be no comment about crypto uh, and there was no comment about crypto. But Josh, you know, start us off. What are you seeing in the space from a regulatory and legislative perspective um, that you think is important for us to consider? You're on mute. Wow. Well, that's... That's pretty broad. There's a lot to consider um, at this time. I think, uh, you know, based on the debate and reactions to the debate, I mean, many say that the debate favored Kamala Harris. Um, and some have said that there was insufficient fact check, fact checking of Kamala Harris and that um, the moderators really took somewhat of an activist in some mm. people's view role. Mm -hmm. um, we are yet to see, you know, how this will play out in terms of the next. We know that there will be at least one um, debate. It sounds like perhaps there will be more than one. There wasn't an opportunity that seemed um, logical to have crypto come up. But I do recall, because I did watch the debate, um, I do recall, I, I believe, Kamala Harris referencing things like AI um, mm. and at least in one exchange. Now I may be mistaken, um, but who knows what future debates will bring. What I what I do think is important though is as we as we think about what each candidate has stood for with respect to crypto yeah. or not, I think we're still waiting for Kamala Harris's position on this, really. Mm -hmm. um, as we are, or as some may say, we are waiting for certain other positions as well. Um, certainly, we know what at least former President Trump's stated position is with respect to crypto, um, but I think this is an important, an important thing to think about. Um, some other things. Certainly, we saw the the settlement just yesterday yep. with uh, with eToro, and that was an interesting settlement, right? Where we now know that um, the only three tokens that eToro will allow U.S. customers to transact in following, I think, a 180-day period during which they can sell off other assets that they have, or Bitcoin, Bitcoin Cash, and ETH. Mm -hmm. um, I would just say, with respect to this, we shouldn't draw too many conclusions, if any, from this settlement, because from the face of the cease and desist order, it says that eToro proposed this settlement. Right. And the SEC accepted. We have no idea what, which, if any, how many tokens the SEC may have alleged were securities or the subject to security subject of securities transactions. Right. We don't know anything like that. We also don't know what uh, what the negotiations were like. We don't know what eToro's motivations were um, and whether they planned to the, use, lose leave the U.S. anyway. I think I saw figures 
saying something like there were about 240,000 U.S. customers of eToro anyway. So that's mm -hmm. relatively small when compared to other trading platforms. Yeah. I think maybe the last thing I'll say on this, I won't go into every like possible thing, um, but you know, I think it's important to remember in a case, and we have cases ongoing right now, you have to prove your allegations. And here, not only were no allegations proved because there was no ad admission or denial of of liability, but also um, there were no allegations made as to any specific tokens. So I think that's important to remember. There was, I think, a $1.5 million fine, but maybe I'll just pivot off of this because there's so much more to talk about. I mean, Josh, to that point, and it's a it's a good case to reference, and, I, and I, I'm, I'm with you. Like, there's a lack of detail. But David, I, you know, let me ask you, because when you look at some of the media reports, I was stunned at how some outlets that I won't name, mm. um, or the usual talking boards mentioned this, which was, oh, it's a clear, it's a picture of the SEC's mind that these are commodities. I mean, I, do you agree with Josh that, I mean, that may not necessarily be the case. No. And look, we have to remember that litigation is expensive. It's time consuming. Um, and they may have just, you know, done a cost benefit analysis and decided that the millions of dollars are spending in fees and the time that they're spending within their company resources on this litigation just wasn't worth, you know, wasn't worth this effort. Um, I I do read that, that that eToro being allowed to, you know, have ETH on their platform is something that they're sort of either tacitly or or, you know, very formally saying that ETH isn't a security because otherwise it would have just been Bitcoin and Bitcoin cash mm. as part of the settlement. So I do think uh, as the optimist that I am, uh, you know, I do think this is a more clear path for ETH in addition, you know, with the ETF that we had, because there's no reason why they would settle this uh, and, and allow ETH to be sold on the platform unless they were comfortable with it. So I think that's an important detail. Josh, yeah. go ahead. I would just say in terms of, and I agree with what David said, in terms of resources, right, and the costs, it's not just on the company side, right? Resource constraints also exist, presumably, on the government side. Right. And so, yeah, that's why I say, like, we don't know what the negotiations were like or what kind of calculations or calculus was done about, you know, likelihood of, of, of different outcomes. But yeah, I agree with David. I, I would say seems like a plus for mm -hmm. for the status of ETH as far as um, whether the SEC views it as a security. Josh, David, thank you so much. In the past couple of days, there have been some other cases. I, you know, I think Uniswap was one we should get to. I have to confess to not having caught up on the case. But one of the other things, David, uh, that caught my eye was, uh, I believe it was the chief accountant at the SEC, um, made a speech. I think earlier this week or, or late last week um, on SAB 121. Mm. And the broad takeaway was that their perspectives haven't changed. And d they delineated, it seems, some exceptions to SAB 121. David, you know, you and I and Josh have had this conversation a lot. Is this, once again, does it seem to be the government picking winners? Um, what's your perspective on some of these statements? You know, it certainly feels that way. Um I think this process has been a little disappointing. Um, I think that, look, we know about Operation Choke Point 2.0, but it does feel like a combination of the SAB 121 and the, the lack of qualified custodians that can hold crypto for the Bitcoin ETFs. Uh, shout out to T0 for getting approval to be a qualified custodian. Yep. but. You know, this combination, I, I think it, it feels just like blocks that are just being put up for, you know, to prevent the industry from expanding right now. Hmm. And I think that, especially with SAB 121, it just doesn't feel like it's in the interests, you know, of the, the banks that want to be involved, the players that want to be involved. It does feel like certain favored players are going to get better treatment. Hmm. But again, you know, that's what it feels like. We don't know for sure. I mean, we hear rumblings. I know I've heard some rumblings. I believe Josh has heard some rumblings. Ron, you may have heard some rumblings. So oh, yeah. 
it it's not the way I think that you know regulation should work. And so I you know I would like to see something comprehensive and available to all entities that are qualified for it, or you know all entities, and not just sort of okay, there are four entities we like, and and they're going to get some dispensation. Yeah, Josh, you know, weigh in on this, and and what are you hearing from the perspective of things like SAB 121, and how do you view it in the context of news we've seen? I think um, we'd seen more crypto ETF custodians, I believe it was for the ARK ETFs, David, Josh, correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, Anchorage and BitGo now uh, custodying some of these crypto ETFs. So that almost feels like a contrary take on it. It's almost a vote of confidence that they'll be able to expand their business going forward. Josh, what's your take on some of the SAB 121 uh, conversation? I mean, from a from a purely like transactional perspective mm -hmm. without going too far, I mean, I I do think that um, of late, more large players who might otherwise be subject to SAB 121 um, have expressed a view that it is likely to go away, right? Um, whereas, yeah, I mean, I, I would just say there seems to be a, a growing feeling of that. Now that, again, as we've talked about in the past, to the extent that there may be exceptions or exemptions from SAB 121, right? In my experience, it appears that that at least sometimes may have something to do with whether there are redundant records or whether there are traditional traditional types of securities that are are tokenized as opposed to what we think of as crypto. Um, so I, I think, yeah, I'm not really sure what more to, to say of that. I think, you know, we've seen Hester Peirce questioning SAB 121. We've seen many others. And yeah, I mean, I think the best we can do as, as counsel is just <laughs> remind people that SAB 121 is there. Yeah. And, you know. Josh, thanks very we'll much. David, Josh, uh, David, one of the things you referenced as well was was T0, um, which was recently approved from the SEC and FINRA for a special purpose broker dealer license. There was only one other up until this week. David, it seems a very long tortured process. I don't know the specifics of the process, but what's your opinion on why the heck does this take so long? And why are, are there more in the pipeline? Where's, where's this special purpose broker dealer thing going? Look, I, I think we all believe there are a number in the pipeline. And what I've heard from people is that it's really in the commission's hands to allow FINRA to allow, you know, to give these licenses and they have discussions and they're being very deliberate about how they go about it. I'm, I'm being as, uh, I'm taking a page from Josh. <laughs> I'm taking a Josh page. I'm giving you a, uh, I'm giving you an answer, a very lawyerly answer, you know, leaning into my lawyer side, but uh, that's really, I think that's the bottom line, Ron. I think that there's the potential to give a number of these licenses and they're just being very deliberate in their process. I, I love my lawyer friends, but every once in a while, the non-answer answers are really hard to digest, but I totally get it, <laughs> David and Josh. David, Josh, let's pivot to, to some other stuff that's uh, happened this week. And uh, David, Josh, the three of us have been texting as usual about um, the usual mayhem in markets. But David, when we look at the economics of what's happening in this space, next week is a very important meeting. Uh, the Federal Reserve, uh, Federal Open Market Committee will be meeting, I believe, we all believe, for an interest rate cut. Uh, as I've often joked with the two, three of us, uh, no more wagers, David, but we could be looking at a 25 basis point interest rate cut. We could potentially, I think there's a, a minimized chance of a 50 basis mm -hmm. point interest rate cut. What are you seeing coming up next week, David? And what? how do you think the crypto markets respond to what might happen? So my crystal ball feels pretty clear that we're going to get 25 and not 50. Yeah. Why? I Well, I'll tell you, it's something we've talked about here time and time again. Yeah. I think that 
there's less of a focus now on inflation and now more of a focus on the labor markets. Hmm. And I think that's come to light because of all these revisions that have come month after month that show a different view of the labor market. And also that for some particular reason in this last month, you know, some food prices have normalized a little bit and are not continuing to go up. And so I think a narrative, is, this narrative is forming that, you know what, job losses are increasing, you know, uh, claims are going up and we need to focus on that and therefore, um, you know, go to 25 and, you know, instead of 50, but fo- more of a focus on that. But one, two things also I'd add is like, this should have been done in July. Um, and we've waited too long and, uh, you know, I, it's unfortunate. And then I think the other thing is that I think Jerome Powell has been very consistent in his messaging. And I don't know that anything has changed dramatically in these last two months or the last few weeks to necessitate 50 basis points. And, And the last thing I'll say is, you know, we are coming up an election and I know it's not a, you know, you know, the administration is not directing uh, you know, Treasury on what to do, but all things being equal, I think 25 in this, in, uh, you know, September makes sense. Josh, weigh in on this. Tell us what you think. And I know, you know, the macroeconomics aren't something you look at on a day-to-day basis, but I'd be interested in your perspectives. So in terms of perspectives, I, I would just say, I don't know that this is my perspective because I don't, I think you guys are much more informed on the likelihood of different percentages of a cut than than I am. Mm -hmm. Um, However, I will note that there is an article um, as of this morning at 9.15 a.m. on Coindesk called Odds of 50 Basis Point Fed Rate Cut Next Week Jump to 45%. Mm -hmm. So it seems like um, that, at least the last time we spoke, it was sounding like 25 was was like a stronger uh there was a stronger view that it would be 25 whereas now it seemed to be going up to uh 45 percent at least based on this um kind of cme i think the cme's um i think those numbers are coming from the cme fed watch yeah yeah it says uh shortly following an article that was published in the new york in the Wall Street Journal, um, that shortly after that article, the chance of the Fed slashing 50 basis points next week per CME FedWatch, which tracks positions in short-term interest rate markets, jumped to more than 40 percent than percentages in the high teens just a few days earlier at press time, which is this morning. The odds of a 50 basis point cut had risen a bit further to 45 percent. Yeah. So I think, yeah, <laughs> your guess is, <laughs> is good and probably better than mine. Um, Let's hope for 50 basis points. So, David, Josh, thanks so much. David, I'm going to push a little bit on one thing, and and you and I have had this conversation many, many times. Uh, And again, for everyone in the audience who's joining us, thank you so much. If you've got questions for Josh or David or I, please put them in the chat. I I would weigh on the side, David, that a 50 basis point cut would be problematic. And my reason reasoning for that is when we look at what the Fed does, the Fed's essentially driving a car by looking in the rearview mirror, right? It's it's. They are data dependent, which we hear a lot, but their data is lagging for the most part. And, you know, you and I have had this conversation many times, often problematic from a revisions perspective, the data that they're looking at, even the inflation data you were just talking about, David, inflation is moderated, but core inflation was still slightly up more than they anticipated. And a lot of economists are sitting back saying, what the heck does this mean? David, my big concern for the market is if the Federal Reserve cuts interest rates 50 basis points, that's going to look panicky. Mm. That's going to look like something not good is happening, and it's not, ha- and it's happening much more quickly than the Fed realized. And let's be candid: most central banks, especially the Fed, are either overreact or underreact because they simply can't react in time. David, am I wrong? No, you're not wrong. Um, I look. We've talked about it before. I think that the economy for lower to middle income earners is tougher and tougher by the day because all of their staples cost more and more food and shelter electricity gas you know for those of us who travel a lot you know flights hotels all of these things are more expensive and these aren't things you can cut back on 
Right. It's not like, hey, I'm going to eat less. I mean, like these, those are not things. That, it's not like, oh, I'm going to go out to dinner less. It's just that could be a thing for some people. But the bottom line is like the core things are more expensive. Yeah. Also, I heard somebody say that, I don't know if you've noticed in some places now, um, companies can pass through the fees you pay on when you charge something at a store. Like, I don't know if you've noticed that, but you could see, I've seen it in pizza places and other restaurants that if you use your card, you know, they can pay another 3%. Yep. So that was something that the restaurants or other stores were eating and now consumers are eating. So, you know, that's another two or 3%. I don't think that's really accounted for, but you know, if you want to pay by card at a restaurant or a pizza place or something else, now you're, you know, you're paying two to 3% more for that. So incrementally, things are definitely going up. And so um, I think that's, you know, problematic. And the last thing I want to say is these high interest rates have really locked people into their residences mm -hmm. because, you know, if you have a great mortgage, what's the impetus to sell your place uh, to get a new place? Maybe you make a big profit, but then you're going to, you know, eat a mortgage that might be three times the rate you're paying. So there are all these intertwined facts that are going on and details going on. But ultimately, I totally agree with you, Ron. I think that would be panicky. I think it would be good for the crypto markets because it's a liquidity issue and a borrowing issue. And I think the you know crypto markets would react very favorably to that. But I think outside of our industry, I it's not the signaling I would want to see. David, well, thanks for that. David, well, do you, th Josh, go ahead. I'm sorry. I was just going to say, so I agree with the, the potential for looking panicky, but I do wonder if people are predicting that it's going to be a 50%, I mean, a, sorry, a 50 basis point cut, mm -hmm. and then it's not, and say that 45% goes up to 60% or some other percentage where it's a majority. I mean, 45% yeah. is already sizable, right? Um, how do you balance that? I mean, does does the aspect where it might look panicky, does that outweigh the fact that people may be pricing in the potential for a 50 basis point cut and then be disappointed? Like, I feel like that ship has sailed about looking panicky or not to a certain extent. I, I don't necessarily disagree with you, Josh, but when you look at the kind of predictive markets and kind of the, the economist consensus, a week ago, it was 50 basis points is a lock. It's the majority of economists. Three days after that, it's uh, new economic data comes out. Things aren't quite as bad as it looks. Quarter print probably makes sense. And the, the, the 50 basis point estimate prior to this morning, what you saw, Josh, was something like less than 25%. Look, the truth of the matter is some segment of the market is not going to be happy no matter what happens. Yeah. And, and the reason for that is exactly, Josh, what you're talking about, which is met or unmet expectations. The other thing is, you know, David, you and I have this conversation. There are there are financial wagers uh, when you look at the credit markets, for example, mm. on what this interest rate cut may or may not be. So, uh, Josh, you're absolutely right. I think whatever the number is, we're going to have a little bit of a downside movement. But it really speaks to what's the longer term financing of, of economic activity going forward. I think the other question, David, tell me if you or Josh disagree with this. Um, it also depends more on how long these interest, these rate cuts go. Mm. Because it's not a one and done. I think the latest economic report I had read was the federal cut, cut interest rates every meeting for the next six or eight meetings. That's almost a year and a half's worth of interest rate cuts. So again, do we become risk on, David, over a, sh a longer period of time? These are I don't, again, I've said it many times, I don't envy the Fed the job. I mm. wish they had better, more real-time data. Um, but I think it's going to be a little bit of a bumpy ride until after the election. Yeah, I agree. I do think it will be more risk on, uh, barring, again, some kind of, you know, geopolitical event. Uh, yeah. You know, as long as that doesn't occur, which obviously we hope it doesn't, uh, I do think we'll be more risk on. I do think... I have a feeling that we kind of hit the bottom in the crypto market for Bitcoin. Hmm. Um, we've kind of been looking at things. We kind of hit certain points one or two times. They call it a double bottom. Yeah. But um, I kind of feel like we may have put the bottom in. Um, so I think without a geopolitical issue, and I would say the other thing is without 
you know, potential Harris administration coming out and saying that they're not pro crypto and they're going to, you know, continue on what the current administration is doing. I think that we may be in the clear as sort of the bottom. You know, and David, when you look at um, some of the moving averages, uh, I'm, I'm, Josh, I'm pulling the David playbook, right? I think Bitcoin's been above its 30 day moving average for a period of time now. I don't know if it's above the 200 day moving average. And David, you and I don't publicly talk about predictions on price, but I, I kind of get the sense we've kind of bottomed out on some of those prices. I, I tend to agree with you. Um, and I know, David, we've only got you for a few more minutes. You've got a hard stop. The Gulf Stream is waiting on the tarmac. Um, <laughs> But David, you know, where do you see some of this going? Again, we're not making predictions, but uh, and I'm not talking about the steak dinner bet. Um, but you know, where do you see the the crypto market going over the course of the remainder of the year? Well, look, we've been in this trading range. Some say it's like fifty to sixty five thousand in Bitcoin. Some say it's fifty three to seventy thousand. I, I want to point out, Josh, that we lost David right around where I was asking him where the price points are going to be. Um, and I suspect he'll be coming back. Um, but I just wanted to ask you as well, you know, uh, what are you seeing in the marketplace? Again, I, I know you can't bring up specific names or specific clients per se, but I had a conversation with a, an attorney friend this week, very much focused on the same space. And his comment to me, Josh, was he's never been busier working with really important, legitimate, well-funded projects. What are your thoughts about some of this? I mean, I think now is a very busy time, you know, I think, and I would agree, I think, as opposed to, I, I don't want to say that there aren't still early stage companies, of course sure. there are, right, or VCs would, it would cease to exist, right, yeah. um, there'd be no one to invest in, but, um, but yeah, I mean, it's an exciting time, I think, regardless of whether people are saying, oh, Bitcoin is, is, down from from its high right it's still pretty far up there compared to if we look back a couple of years yeah um, and and i think you know ron you may very well be vindicated by the end of the year with your bet because there has been some press about people making some some pretty ambitious predictions about the price but of course uh we never give investment advice. <laughs> we never give investment advice. David, I'm assuming the Starlink Wi-Fi failed on the Gulf Stream, but we're, <laughs> we're, we're glad to have you back. I wanted to give you an opportunity to finish that thought. I know you got to hop in a couple of minutes. Well, you know, I like to be. <laughs> can you guys hear me now? I don't know. Maybe We, we, uh... we can hear you, we but you've you. gone off camera and we've lost him again. <laughs> This is turning out to be one of the weirder episodes that we've had, Josh, and we've got a whole bunch of people watching. We're going to make it a relatively short episode. If you've got questions for Josh and hopefully David. Who may one, one more time. Uh, I do have to go in two minutes, but clearly uh, they want it to be a cliffhanger. Um, but I will say this, Ron, I fully intend to be having a sumptuous meal on your nickel by the end of the year. Oh, <laughs> uh, well. And I'm willing to double down on that because I'm as much as I would like to see us hit 125 by the end of the year. Um, I I don't see it. Uh, I don't see it. For but let me, let me finish my thought really quick. Yeah, go for it. We've been in this band between either 50 and 65 or 53 and 70, depending on who you, you know, what you're looking at and when you're looking. And I think if we can get above that band, um, especially above 70, I think we'll, we'll make a, you know, a new all time high. But as long as we're trading in these bands, you know, I think we're going to be a little bit range bound for another couple of weeks. David, I know you got to hop. Thanks so much for everyone in the audience. David Brill is still looking for steakhouse recommendations in the tri-state area when I anticipate losing the bet with, to him. So if you've got recommendations, hit him up on LinkedIn, drop us a note at info at WSBA.co. Josh, let me give you a couple of minutes for closing thoughts and we'll wrap it up. David, you've got to go. Take care. Good to see you. Take care, everybody. Josh, what are your thoughts for the coming week and what are you going to be working on? So I can't say exactly what I'll be working on, <laughs> but what I would say is I think there's so much, so many interesting pieces coming together at long last. I mean, we saw just in the past couple of days, Caroline Ellison's, uh, yes. Caroline Ellison's uh, lawyers arguing for essentially, you know, time served, right, due to her um, 
I think they refer to it as extraordinary cooperation with the government. And I think it will be interesting to see um, how that plays out alongside, obviously, SBF. We know what happened there. Um, so I, I think I'll be, you know, waiting to see that. I mean, certainly we continue to see, you know, developments on a daily basis as, as we always have. Sorry, there's a, a fly here. I don't know if you can see that. But um, this is definitely a Friday the 13th broadcast <laughs> between you and I and David. Yeah. And <laughs> sorry about that. But with respect to the Uniswap settlement with the CFTC, yes, it's been please. somewhat controversial. I mean, given given the time limitations, I won't delve into the details. But I would just say, if we look at this from the perspective that we might, that, you know, I was advocating with respect to the eToro settlement. Yes. We don't know why people make certain decisions. Mm -hmm. um, we don't know what kind of um, business decisions they may have. Also, as David noted, legal fees can be yeah. expensive. And, um, you know, we know that Uniswap had mentioned or, you know, issued a statement about having received a wealth notice in the past. And you never know. I mean, it could be that this was just a small, I mean, it was $175,000 settlement. Yeah. And, yeah. you know, some of the dissents from two of the commissioners, um, Commissioner Spam and Mersinger, you know, had said, among other things, well, it it looks like this is just um, the CFTC trying to assert jurisdiction over DeFi before the SEC does. But you never know how this may play out. And um, in the, in the, I guess all I'm trying to say is, to the extent that someone wa may want to have an argument in the future that actually what a business does is already being properly regulated by a different regulator, you right. never know. You know, it's interesting. Shout out to, uh, you know, we do our policy updates on a regular uh, every month. Josh, Dina Ellis and Adam Goldberg, we often have a conversation around how much of what happens is regulatory turf war. And obviously regulators have an obligation to fulfill their mandates, but it's an interesting political conversation. Josh, we'll end it there before the Friday to the 13th broadcast makes it even crazier. A couple of real quick announcements for everyone, everyone in the audience. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, October 24th in New York City, we have our WSBA Crypto and Blockchain Summit 2024. If you can join us, you'll see Josh Clayman on stage. You'll see David Brill, Annalise Osborne, a whole bunch of colleagues will be there. It'll be great if you could join us. Look, Find more information on our website, wsba.co. Uh, the big banner on the top of the page. If you can register and join us, that will be great. Josh, we have our legal working group next week. Some of this other stuff will come up, I'm sure, but I will leave it there. Josh, as always, thank you so much. Thank you for everyone in the audience who joined us. David Brill, somewhere out there getting on a private jet. Thank you for joining us, and we will see you all next week. Bye. Thank you.